Hello, this is Mr. Froelich. Today's screencast will be going through Earth's motion in space. This is officially the start of a new unit. In this particular unit, we'll be starting with going into detail on how Earth moves in space. Now, this is not always an intuitive thing to think about since it's something that we don't get to see every day. But what we do get to experience is how this affects us. So this screencast will be going through these two topics. So the first thing that we have to go through is the two ways that objects in space can move. The first one is rotation, which is when an object is spinning along an axis inside of itself. You can sort of think of a top or a fidget spinner. In this case, that fidget spinner is spinning or rotating along the center of itself. Earth does this also. It will spin along an axis inside of itself. Here's a quick animation that shows a simplified version of its motion. It's not hard to imagine that there is a, an imaginary line that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole that shows the rotation of Earth in this fashion. Now, the other way that objects in space can move is called revolution, which is where an object will move around another object. In this case, you can sort of think of a roundabout. St. Cloud is filled with roundabouts, and we've probably all been through one. And when you're doing this, your car is revolving around the center of that roundabout. You're not spinning in that roundabout. You are revolving around the middle. Now, Earth does this also. It will revolve around the sun, which means it basically makes a lap around the sun. And it takes time for this to happen, which we call one orbit. Overall, we have used this information to construct the way that we tell time. This means that the motions of the Earth around the Sun along with the Moon, which we will get into later, have been used to build our current calendars and clock system across the entire planet. So reviewing the ways that we've defined time along with the motions of Earth is something that you maybe have known or understood for a while, but it is important to go back and connect how these two things relate. In terms of rotation, that is what we define as a day on Earth. If you were standing at the North Pole looking straight down, it would take about 23.9 hours for Earth to make one rotation or spin one time. If you were looking at the solar system from the top down, you would see that Earth revolves around the Sun every 365.25 days, which we've defined as a year. Now many of you have maybe heard of something called a leap year. A leap year was invented to keep the drift of our calendar from occurring over several thousand years. It happens every four years because that 0.25 extra days that occur every year will eventually add up to be one whole extra day which is added to the calendar as February 29th every four years. Overall, both the rotational period and revolution period of Earth can get very complicated based on which frame of reference you are looking at. These are a simplified version to help us understand the concepts and how they relate back to our daily life. So another way that Earth's motion will affect us daily will be in the form of seasons. Now you have to remember that Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. This means that at different points in the year you will be closer or farther away from the Sun. And that's what the tape measure is showing here. So it turns out that we are closer to the Sun on one end of the orbit at about 147 million kilometers from the Sun. And on the further end, we will be about 152.1 million kilometers from the Sun for a difference of about 5 million kilometers. No big deal. Now the interesting part about this is it is not what creates the seasons on Earth because we are actually closer to the Sun in January and furthest from the Sun in July. So you might be thinking right now, well then why is it cold in the winter if we are so much closer to the Sun at that time? Well, as it turns out, there is a larger factor besides the distance from the Sun that actually creates and controls our season. 
This is the fact that Earth's orbit is not straight up and down, it is actually tilted at 23 and a half degrees from the vertical. Some people have maybe noticed this when they look at a globe in real life, that the globe does not rotate straight up and down like you would expect. It is tilted as a way to show the tilt of Earth in real life. What this does is it makes the amount of sunlight or energy radiation we get from the sun change over the course of a year. And it creates a large imbalance from the North Pole to the South Pole over the course of six months. If you think back to the energy balance of the atmosphere that we discussed earlier in the weather unit, you would remember that we get 100% of our energy in the atmosphere producing our weather from the sun. Now what this does is it still keeps that 100%, but it changes that value of 100% over the course of a year. Similar to me still getting 100% of my paycheck, but I just get more or less money in that paycheck. So in other words, when the North Pole, which is the circle dot, is pointed towards the sun, it's going to receive more solar radiation and warm up, creating the season of summer. In the South Pole, which is technically right now pointed away from the sun, you would have lower amount of radiation and it would get colder, creating winter. So when the North Pole is pointed towards the sun, you're going to get more energy and that is the creation of the season of summer. When that pole shifts six months later, now the North Pole is pointed away from the sun, it's going to get less energy and now we have the season of winter and the South Pole would have the season of summer because it now is pointed towards the sun. So this explains two of the extreme warm and cold seasons that we have. So let's put all of this information together. Here we have Earth doing its rotation once per day and one revolution plotted over the course of a year. Now it's important to note that while we look at this, the North and South Pole, which are drawn with the white line, are going to be pointed the same direction no matter what part of the year you're in. But this means that at certain points in the year you'll have your North Pole pointed towards the Sun, or your North Pole pointed away from the Sun, and the same thing for the South Pole. Now we are going to go through what this means for creating the seasons for us, uh, and we're going to focus on the Northern Hemisphere only because that's where we live. So the first season that we want to highlight will be called the Winter Solstice. The Winter Solstice occurs when the North Pole is pointed away from the Sun the most it will be over the course of the entire year. This happens on December 21st, give or take a couple of days, and what it means is that we have the shortest daylight and longest nighttime over the course of the whole year. Now the summer solstice, six months later, occurs on June 21st, and it is when the North Pole is pointed towards the Sun the most it will be over the course of the year. This in turn gives us the longest day and shortest night of the year. In between these two times, you have the fall equinox and the spring equinox, which are the days where you have exactly equal day and night. So over the course of the entire year, we have our progression of the seasons, but we also change the amount of daylight we get every single day by a couple of minutes. You maybe don't notice this from day to day, but after a couple of weeks or months, it's easy to tell that we are either increasing our sunlight in the spring and summer and decreasing our sunlight in the fall and winter and repeating that cycle every year. So according to the way that we've organized the seasons on this diagram, summer doesn't start until June 22nd, and winter doesn't start until December 21st. But you might be thinking right away, that doesn't seem to line up with what we consider the actual seasons of winter, summer, spring, and fall. And that is because we have only plotted the astronomical seasons. These are the seasons as told by the position of Earth around the sun, not necessarily by the weather that we experience. So when we plot the meteorological seasons, which are the colored arrows now, that's a general representation of when we actually feel the weather from each season. So in red, I've colored the summer arrow, sort of starting at the beginning of June and ending maybe mid-September. Those are the times when we feel those temperatures and weather patterns that are similar to summer. 
Winter, which seems to last forever, can start sometimes at the beginning of November and reach all the way through March. This would mean the arrow for the winter would need to take longer and cover more of Earth's revolution than one quarter of it around the sun. So let's take a look at what we see from the ground as a result of the motion of Earth in space. The first thing is the rising and setting of the sun every single day, which is caused by Earth's rotation. This means that the sun is not moving out in space in our frame of reference, instead we are the ones who are moving in a pattern similar to the animation showed in the top right corner. Now the path that the sun makes is this arc, and the position of that arc is going to change every day with the change of the seasons. So in certain points of the year, like summer, that arc will be much higher in the sky, which gives you a direct or more direct sunlight, which absorbs more radiation creating higher temperatures. In the winter, that arc will become lower to the ground, which gives you less hours of daylight and also a lower angle, so you absorb less of that energy. This is caused by the revolution and tilt of Earth around the sun, which means the North Pole and South Pole do not point straight up and down. An easy way to help visualize this is to look at a solar graph. The solar graph shown here is a time-lapse photo of the position and path of the sun taken over the course of a year, and it shows a clear difference between the summer and the winter arcs or paths of the sun. Another way to look at this is to look at the rising and setting of the moon. Now the moon does revolve around Earth, but it takes longer than one Earth rotation to do so, so the motion of the moon in our sky is caused because Earth is rotating, not because the moon is revolving. We will cover this more when we get to the moon unit. A very cool time lapse also shows the rising and setting of stars and constellations. Now this again happens because Earth is rotating once per day. And you'll notice that there is a focal point to this which is the North Star. The North Star is important not because it's the brightest or largest star in the sky, but because it lines up perfectly with the rotational axis of our North Pole, making it the focal point of all of the rotation of stars in the North Hemisphere. I hope that this helps shed some light on the motions of Earth in space around the Sun. If you have questions, feel free to reach out through Schoology or Google Meet and I will do my best to help you understand these concepts. Thank you for watching.